It is just a huge honor for me today to be podcast interviewing attorney Matthew W. Odgers. And he'll tell you it's Odgers like Dodgers, but it's really Odgers like the Arizona Diamondbacks. So just remember that Matthew W. Odgers, Arizona Diamondback Esquire. He's the owner and founder of Odgers Law Group, a dental specific law firm based in San Diego, California. The practice services dentists throughout California with an emphasis on practice purchase and sales, associate employment agreements, dental office leases, partnerships, and estate planning for dentists. After graduating from Purdue University in three years with a Bachelor of Arts in Political Science, Matthew Auger spent a year in Seoul, Korea teaching English. From there, he moved back to San Diego where he started law school and developed a passion for healthcare law. In 2013, attorney Odgers decided to branch out and start up his own firm to better serve the legal business needs of dentists. Odgers Law Group works regularly with young associates and new dentists by making sure they are legally protected as they pursue the career of their dreams. He regularly lectures on dental-related topics at dental schools and through online CEO courses and webinars, which I hope you put one up on Dental Town. We, yeah. we, we got 400 courses. They've been viewed almost a million times. Millennials love hour-long courses. Um, yeah. In 2016, Audgers Law Group was named one of Entrepreneur Magazine's top 365 best businesses in the nation and is recognized as a rising star by Super Lairs. Um, it's really an honor to get you on the show. And before you start, I just want to remind my homies, I know you just graduated from dental kindergarten school. Uh, this is August 21st. You've probably been a real live dentist for two months now. But remember when you graduated? When you walk down that aisle, they said, congratulations, you're a doctor of dental surgery and you don't know anything about anything else. In 32 years as a dentist, they tell me their nightmare story. The last one in Phoenix was um, he was renting a thousand square foot and the roof started leaking. Turns out he's responsible for the leak and he had to repair the roof for 10,000 square foot of retail to get the water to quit. And I'm like, well, man, I'd go back to your attorney who signed off on this and chew him out. And they go, oh, yep. I, 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 I didn't have an attorney. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought you told me you were a dentist, but you're really an attorney. So what is it about dentists and physicians who always think they can do their own law? Yeah, well, the biggest thing that we come across is not so much that they think that they can do their own law. They just have a lot on their plate and taking the time out of their day when they're going to set up their practice or purchase a practice and actually meet with someone to explain all the finer points. Um, they think that there's a lot of trust that goes into working with the other party and working with some of the landlords when there really shouldn't be that trust altogether. Um, and there's a certain level of trust that you can get to after a certain point, but the decisions that dentists are making at that stage are going to impact really the next 10, 15, 20 years of their life. And so they're incredibly important decisions. And well, you, you're, you're, you're being too nice. You're, you're telling them that they just got a lot on their plate and all that kind of thing. I, I, I think that for some reason, when you're a doctor, you always think you're, uh, I, I tell my boys, they say, well, what does a DDS mean? I go, well, I didn't get a DDS. I got a DOE. It means doctor of everything. So I know absolutely everything. Everything in the universe was taught in dental school. And my God, how many nuances do you find each year? All you do is dental law. How many That's weird nuances do you see each year that you've never seen before? Oh, every transaction, I pick up something new yeah. that, that comes up and I've added to my list of things to be aware of. And really, you know, getting through dental school is no small feat. And dentists are incredibly bright. But there's something with just getting through a lot of these transactions that, um, that really is what makes the attorney incredibly important. They can foresee things that aren't necessarily intuitive, even if you read through the agreement and understand everything about it. So when I go to McDonald's, and I go there every day because I'm a health food fanatic. Um, you know, basically, I'm going to order a hamburger, a fry, and a Coke. What is your hamburger, fry, and a Coke? When when a dentist calls you, what what what, what are the top three or four reasons they're calling you? Weighted by yeah. volume. Yeah, absolutely. So if it's a new associate, somebody who's a recent grad, um, usually they're calling because they're going to go work for somebody else, and they ask if I can review their associate agreement. 
And in doing that, I dive in and I just make sure that the terms are fair and most importantly, that the dentist understands what they're signing up for. And then try and negotiate some of those terms if okay, they're not. Okay, well, I, I got to stop you right there because this is why we started Dental Town. So when I saw the internet came out, I said the internet can make it so that no dentist ever has to practice solo again. And they are telling my young kids who graduated about four hours ago, well, we, you know, we have 500 offices across the nation and these are standard contracts and we don't negotiate and it is what it is. So sign right there or we'll see you. So they sign it. And I'm like, are you kidding me? The fastest growing business in dentistry right now is dental recruiting agencies because these big DSOs, some of these DSOs on any given days, 10% of all their dental offices don't even have a dentist working. So which one is it? Are they really desperate to get a dentist associate or and, and or is it an ironclad agreement if you go work for the big ones, Heartland, Aspen, um, Pacific, it just is what it is. Yeah, so there is that certain element of it is what it is with some of the bigger DSO companies that are out there. And really the role that I facilitate is explaining all the terms to the dentist and letting them know kind of what else is out there if they were to pursue a different company or, um, you know, to make sure that when they do sign that agreement that they're comfortable with everything that they're signing up for. Sometimes the big companies have quite a bit of leverage and you can get a little bit more compensation from time to time. So, from or, or any, I mean, drop names on the, which big ones are non, is there any that are just non-negotiable? I mean, is Heartland, Aspen or Pacific non-negotiable? No, it depends on it depends on when in the relationship you try and negotiate. Some of the some of the terms such as compensation and um, and who's going to cover malpractice insurance. From time to time, those can be negotiated. But when the associate goes ahead and signs kind of a commitment letter or a letter of intent that that states kind of what those main terms are, those are usually the negotiable terms. And then when they actually get the agreement, the agreement's less negotiable. But with that said, um, it's always good to have an attorney look at it. And we have had success once in a blue moon negotiating, depending on the need of the, of the practice and of the bigger DSO. If it's in an area where they're just having a hard time getting any associates, um, we can identify that and we can be a little bit more strict with, um, be a little bit more hard nosed with what we go in there and what we ask for. So the main reason dentists are calling you is look at their associates agreement. No, that's that's just one of the that's one of the reasons. Um, the second is after they've become an associate and have a little bit of experience and they want to step into practice ownership, um, they call to kind of discuss how that's going to look and see where how an attorney can help them throughout the practice purchase process. Okay, and um, you know, you you tell them you know that the the number one cause of divorce is getting married. And if yeah. you just don't get married and, you know, when you get married, you got all these great things, love and kids and family, and it fails half the time. Now you're going to marry a dentist without any of those glues. You don't, you don't sleep together. You don't have babies. Um, um, so I say, did you get a prenuptial agreement on your marriage? No. Uh, well, did you get a prenuptial agreement with your dentist associate contract that sh shows me a clear exit strategy in time of divorce? And it's usually this general stuff like, like you, you can't, uh, if you leave, you can't take my patients. Okay. Well, he left and he took your patients. Now what? And, and you're standing yeah. there in front of the judge and the judge says, well, it just says you can't do it. It doesn't say what happens if you do it. I mean, if you had told me that he was fined a thousand dollars per chart, I'd enforce it, but you just, you, you didn't, you didn't tell me anything. You just said, don't do it. Um, so what are the nuances when you're, um, trying to, um, um, buy a, get married to a dentist? Yeah, well, and that's a great point, and that's where working with an attorney is helpful because you want to kind of keep the goodwill going between either the buyer and the seller. You don't want the dentist to go in there and have to fight tooth and nail for each one of these nuances. And by bringing in a dental attorney who understands those, um, they can lean on me or the dental attorney to kind of be the bad guy and look out for their best interest and dive in to get all those specifics. But some of the specifics, like you just mentioned, are um, what to do at the time of, of, of split, who's going to take the patients, and whose property they are. 
uh, the patient charts and then what kind of recourse there is in the event that um, the associate who leaves tries to solicit some of those patients. Okay, I, I, I've lectured a thousand times, so I, before every break I say, okay, before we take a break, anybody have any questions? No one has a question. Then you do break and you get stormed by 20 people who think they have this unique question that's never yeah. unique. So there's already, I already know my homies, there's already people listening to me saying, I don't wanna to listen to this podcast because I have I have a, a, a unique situation. If one of my homies wants to contact Matthew W. Odgers, um, do you take clients out of California or is this an only California play? So it's mostly California. There's a few states that I have relationships with other attorneys that I'll work with local counsel and that's Texas, Nevada, Arizona, Oregon, um, and Washington right now. Okay. Um, so it's, uh, it's, uh, California, uh, Texas, Arizona. What was the other one you said? Uh, Nevada. Nevada, Oregon, Just Oregon, and Washington. Oregon, and what? Uh, Washington. Uh, so the whole West Coast, really. So you're a you're a West Coast. So if someone's in Cali, Texas, Arizona, Nevada, Oregon, or Washington, and they have a unique question, how should they just stop and contact you now? What What's the best way? Yep. And what are the terms on that? If they if they call you, is it a one nine hundred number that charges a dollar a minute, or how, how's this work? No, not at all. They call, call my office and uh, my secretary schedules a 15 minute free consult. And a lot of times I'm able to answer those one off questions and kind of point them in the right direction at no charge. And what, uh, what's that number? You want to give it on the air? Yeah, it's 858-869-1114. Okay, so if, if you have a unique question, and by the way, this isn't a commercial. He didn't pay to get on. He probably doesn't even know who the hell I am. I, I begged him to come on the show, not vice versa. You can call them at 858-869-114, but I encourage you just to listen to this show because um, you everyone calling has the same four questions. Um, so um, um, I I want to go back on, on to that marriage deal. So now she's yeah. an associate at a dental office and mm -hmm. already some of these dentists are saying, well, if you're gonna work for me, you know, I, I wanna buy in and I want um, you to sign an associate contract now. And she's like, well, you know, I dated my husband for a year before we got to that, that point. And some of these dental, some of these dental offices, they, they want commitment to a buy-in relationship at the start. Yeah. How, how, yeah. How, do, how do you do that? How do, how do you, how do you get married on the first date? I'm not a expert oh. on Tinder. Maybe uh, you can fill me in. Absolutely. So <laughs> the, the, the best bet is to, if you're on the associate side is to give yourself some outs. If you do agree to do that. Um, usually we recommend working with somebody for at least a year, if not two years to determine kind of what the internal practice culture is like, see how the relationship is, see if they kind of build up that deep trust between the owner, doctor and the associate and see if it's somebody that you do want to enter into that partnership or the marriage with or buy them out and be responsible for all the patients. So usually we, we try and talk the talk our clients into giving it time. And if they are getting pressured into signing an early associate agreement or an early buy-in agreement, um, we want to figure out some potential outs so they can walk away if they choose to without sacrificing too much. And some well, of the ways what, what are some possible outs? Yeah, like, so, like if the Dodgers beat the Cardinals, then you can just tear up the contract. Yeah. So I am a Padres fan being from San Diego. So oh, the Dodgers are, you? are yeah, with the last name, it, oh. it's more genetic thing, but, but are you a Chargers fan? That's what I want to know. Yeah. That one's rough. I, I still <laughs> am. I, I haven't found a second team yet, but I'm, I'm still shopping around. Um, but yeah, the, some of those outs are um, having a short term to where it's either exercised with a buy-in within say two years, or the associate has the right to walk away, or um, a gradual pay increase that, that tears it up that means that at some point the associate's gonna be making more money than other associates if the owner doctor doesn't let them buy in. Um, so those are two of kind of the regular ones that we use. Um, and, and also just kind of keeping the lines of communication open between the owner doctor and the associate and seeing where the owner doctor is in their life and 
Um, sometimes uh, selling a doctor it can say right now that I want to be out in two or three years. And then before you know it, the two or three years are up and they're not ready to give up the reins. Ding, ding, the- ding, 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 ding. Did you hear what he just said? That's what I've been saying for 32 years. When a doctor says he's going to retire at 65 and he's 62, he gets to 65 and he thinks, damn, I got 100,000 miles on my car. Uh, my spouse wants to redecorate the house. I want to go on a vacation. One of my children needs money. They never, ever... You know how hard it is to just wake up one morning and say, I need no more new money for the rest of my life. I mean, that's, and when when people say only 3% of dentists can retire at 65, well, they could all retire at 65, but they couldn't retire at 65 saying, I need no more new money because their lifestyle is vastly exceeds uh, gravity. Uh, so, um, in fact, I say it's the opposite problem. I say you go get an associateship. The old man says he's going to sell it to you in two years. Two years go by and he doesn't want to sell it to you. Uh, yeah. or, or he wants to be a partner. So, um, um, so, so, um, do, uh, so do well, what, what percent of these um, partnerships, uh, if they date for a year or two, they buy the practice, what percent of them in your experience or in your sphere still end up in divorce? Is it a small so, problem, a large problem? No, it's a, I'd say it's a, it's a medium problem. And going into it, you kind of have an idea as to which ones may end up in divorce and which ones are committed based on kind of the personality types of both dentists. But Oh, um, don't stop there. Tell us what these personalities, what are the red flags? Yeah, so some of the red flags are, um, I mean, it's, it's really just the level of control in which the either party wants and the, the level of passiveness of the other party. So sometimes you'll have somebody who's just incredibly domineering, um, who's the owner doctor and the associate comes in and being new, maybe a little bit more passive. And in that scenario, the associate doesn't identify exactly what they want and their expectations are, are high, but the owner doctor doesn't necessarily know that. And, um, and it just leads to a big blow up at some point. So, so let me okay. give you, let me give you a skill, what I do. So you go in there and these controlling domineering people, they always want to small talk. Hey, how's the wife, the kid, the dog, how's your granddaughter? How's Taylor Marie doing? And it's all good and great. But then I clap my hand and say, okay, let's go to work. And successful people are the ones that have the highest number of uncomfortable conversations. So okay. I, so quit out the, the small talk clap, get their attention, say, okay, let's go to work. I, 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 we, we have a, a question, um, supplies. You say this should be 40%. I mean, that's a hundred percent variance. So, so clap your hands, get them out of small talk. Let's go to work, call it work, clap your hands. Let's go to work and talk about something uncomfortable so that we can be more successful down the road. So the first red flag you said was the level of control domineering versus passive. What are other red flags? What, what about if the selling uh, dentist, um, what, what if no one in the office, what, what if the dentist has worked there 30 years and no one in the office has been there more than five years, that high employee turnover, does that mean most of the employees left because some, there was, uh, the owner was dysfunctional? Is that a red flag or not? What, what are the other red flags that you're seeing? I don't want to lead the witness. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So the potentially high turnover could be a personality thing, or it could be a spending habit thing where the owner dentist just doesn't give raises or doesn't keep up with, um, with kind of the industry standard when it comes to payment. So that's the other big red flag that I see is, is kind of spending habits of the two different parties. And sometimes you'll have a, uh, owner who's very conservative or it will go out and spend you know, the full amount on everything and is constantly working in a deficit. So you want to make sure that fiscally both partners kind of have the same mindset when it comes to growth and spending and um, finances. Otherwise, there's going to be issues um, with the kind of philosophy of the practice. And that that's the same as divorce, too. They say the most perfect marriages are when two savers get married. Yeah. But when two spenders get married, they're always going in wanting more raises and they're trying to buy some stock that's going to double because the issue is spending. And yeah. so, so yeah, so I would see that as a huge flag. Your, your dentist is a spender, goes to a seminar, always gets excited, 
walks out of his seminar and wants to buy a CAD cam or a laser or some, you know, he wants to drop a hundred grand because it'll make him feel good in yeah. the short term. And the other one says, says, gosh, look how many MOD composites I would have to do to pay for that damn thing. I, I don't want to buy it. So spending yeah. habits would be huge. Uh, what are yeah. some other red flags? And just personality types. When you have that awkward conversation that you were talking about, um, where you sit down and you say, everybody let's talk about, let's make each other uncomfortable and talk about the things we don't want to. There's people who just can't do that. It's not in their skill set, and they're just unable. And if that's the case, um, that should be identified a little bit early on, and maybe they should kind of go a different route than a partner, than an associate buy-in, and potentially purchase a practice altogether. So, I think that that's kind of my key takeaway is getting to know the client and determining whether it's going to be a good fit with their personality to do a buy-in after meeting the other, the owner doctor, or if it's not going to be a good fit, then start looking for a practice that can have a quick transition period where they can step in and be the owner, you know, within three to six months and take everything over and, um, and not have to risk that divorce. And so it's identifying those personality types and kind of helping them go down the correct path. I, I want to ask you another question. Um, a lot of um, a lot of people tell me that they they don't want to deal with the business. They just want to get a job and live happily ever after. And I say, yeah. okay, well, if that if that matches with dentist good, then. Why don't we go find all the graduates from your dental school four years ago and they should all be working as an associate living happily ever after. And every yeah. time I find someone five years out of school, they've had five different associate jobs. It doesn't matter if it's private or public. It doesn't matter if it's Big Heartland or a little small office in Parsons. Do you see associate dentist? Um, what, what percent of associates dentists say, this is great. I just come in and do dentistry, no big deal. And I just leave it all here at five o'clock versus how many of them are like, you know what? The only way I'm going to be happy is if I own this thing and do it my way. What, what, where do you think the breakdown so, is? Yeah. So the breakdown on a whole, I, I couldn't speak to because the people that I see usually want to be practice owners and whether they're in their first stage of being an associate, um, Usually they're serious enough to where they'll reach out and talk to an attorney because they're going down the ownership route and they want to cultivate that relationship early on. Okay. How uh, many years out of school is this person um, usually? Usually one to two. One to two uh, years out. And are they more likely to be boys, girls, short, fat, tall, skinny, any, you know, any other demographic? Or is it more girl than boy, boy than girl? It's about equal. Um, okay, so I, see, that's another I, thing they keep saying. Oh, these girls, they, they just want to stay home and have a family. It's like, dude, I graduated 32 years ago, and those 20 girls in my class, they all averaged a bigger, more successful office than their oh, male that's... counterparts. They all, Almost all of them had a million-dollar practice. So well, so you're it, saying men and women are, are equal amounts. So you don't, you don't buy no. into the girls want to be associates at DSOs. No. And, um, and I don't know statistically how that looks, but I know that if you want your, the most amount of flexibility um, to do what, anything you want outside, owning your own practice and kind of creating it in the way that works for you is the only way to do that. You're not going to, you may be able to find a boss that's going to allow that, but if you have a pivot or something like that, it's going to be hard to get that boss to pivot with you. Absolutely. Absolutely. And in, in yeah. fact, I think one of the, the business models that hasn't proved yet is I'm just going to own a bunch of dental office and have a bunch of dentists do all the dentistry. I just want to yeah. know where all these dentists are, because when I look at the, the associate shifts in private and, and, and public, um, it looks like the average associates only lasting a year or two. Absolutely. And I get that. I get that call maybe once a week from uh, past clients who are looking for a good associate that doesn't want to own or that doesn't want to buy in. And they're just very few and far between. Yeah, um, it's, it's a rare breed. I, I've actually had more luck finding, uh, okay, so I'm in Arizona, which is the yeah. only state will, which will accept your dental license from the other 49 states. And yeah. it's always the same thing. My best luck, my, my 10 year doctors that made me bank, it was always like, you know what? I did my practice. I put my kids through college. I'm done and I live in this 
frozen tundra called New Jersey, Wisconsin, North Dakota. And my wife, you know, every time we go to Scottsdale, she just, we just want to retire in the sun and just get a job and just, and oh my gosh, so they got all the experience. They know how to talk to people. And by the way, the one thing I want to take issue with what you said is when you said they, they don't have that confrontational style. So they're, they're passive. They just don't want to confront. Well, dude, you have to fix that because you're the same person who can't look in the patient's eyes and say, I'm sorry, dude, you have 11 cavities and we need to do 11 fillings. On so when you can't confront people, um, then you can't sell dentistry. And if you can't sell dentistry, I don't want to die and have my five grandkids go to you and each one of them has a cavity and you can't convince any of them to pull out their debit card and get it done. And you yeah. need to learn how to confront people because people want to hear that they're beautiful. They don't want to hear that they have 10 cavities and gum disease. And you need oh. to learn how to be a real doctor, which is to get a good diagnosis and treatment plan. So with the patient, you have 10 cavities. With the associate you're working for, um, the, the beef I hear the most from associates that they finally say, I'm forget it, I'm done, is they know they're driving into work, they got this big day, they got you know some difficult cases, and they get there and they, they get a temp dental assistant. <coughs> That they, yeah. they've never seen. and they're like well where's where's my girl trusty oh well oh. Here, here's a temp uh yeah her name's ella it's like oh my god it's uh it's it's crazy um so they they are calling you a year or two out of school the ones mm -hmm. that aren't calling you i know what they're thinking because they post on dental down they're thinking well i can't buy a practice i got two hundred eighty seven thousand dollars of student loans no one's gonna loan me a dime so she's yeah. listening to you right now and she hates her associate job and, but she doesn't think she can buy an, an, an expensive practice in California. What is the average practice going for in San Diego and how much student loan debt does she have before they say no dice? Yeah. So Dennis banks love lending to dentists and it's been that way at least the last six or seven years. Um, and it's not like any other type of lending, you know, uh, I think a lot of people, dentists in particular, view their ability to buy a practice as if it were their ability to go out and purchase a home. But the banks look for different criteria when it comes to that. So to answer your question, um, the practice, the average practice price that we work with is around 700,000. Um, they range from on the small end to 200,000 to the high end of, I would say 4 million is the, is the biggest practice we've done. Um, and the student loans that the, that this dentist has coming into it um, range anywhere from 200,000 to 600,000. And I've seen people get approved um, and get through it. What the banks are looking closely at is the dentist's ability to replicate the ca cash flow of the practice after they purchase it. So if the, if the practice is doing $700,000 a year um, and the dentist has 400,000 in student loans, um, the banks are going to look at, do we think that this dentist is capable of keeping that $700,000 cash flow? And with that, is the dentist going to be able to service all of their student loan debts, any other financial debt that they have, um, and still have enough of a profit to live on? So it, it always surprises me. Any other industry, um, somebody who's a year or two out of dental school, uh, wouldn't be able to get the loans that dentists are able to get. So it's worth having that initial conversation with the banker and, and having them um, submit kind of the general information to see what you can be approved for. Well, when, when should she call you? Yeah, so as early as possible. I have, a, I have a client out here who called me a year before she graduated, a doctor, Lisa Dawn, and came into the office and sat down and just introduced herself and um, she's a year, she graduated and has been practicing for a year and just opened up her own practice. A huge success story, but part of that was, um, in order for a lot of dentists to be successful, they kind of need a team of professionals who understand dentistry. And the sooner they can build out that team of people who they can go to for advice, the quicker they're gonna be able to make moves. And not all the professionals, including myself, um, I can't speak for others, but um, are going to charge the brand new dentist to give them a uh, give them an hour's worth of their time to answer questions and put them on the right track. Um, a lot of the professionals are more interested in kind of the long game and saying, "I get it. You're you're getting ready to graduate, 
And when you do, you're going to be a perfect candidate to work with me. But for right now, let me just start educating you on the process and letting you know what what types of things to look for and what types of things to avoid and when to actually call me, which is um, for my services, which is when you found a practice or when you're fed up of being an associate or when you need that associate agreement reviewed. So I I, I want to ask you, you said something um, earlier, but um, she might not understand why, why you said that. Um, You said that um, banks love dentists. um, And so if you look at the uh, SBA failure and charge off rates for the healthcare industry, the lowest is uh, veterinary services. I mean, uh, veterinary service, number two lowest, Next is dentists. Then it goes yeah. a little higher with optometrists, then podiatrists, then physical occupation, speech therapists, then physicians, except for mental health. And a really high one is mental health specialists. And then uh-huh. the highest is chiropractic, where, you know, they, um, and, and even with chiropractors, it's only three and a half percent failure rate. And dentists are less than a one percent failure rate. So explain to her why. Uh, dentists have an industry charge off rates under 1% uh, and which is why they can be more selective about where they loan their money. Why, why do dentists have a less than 1% charge off rate to banks? Yeah. So after the transition, there's gen- provided that it's done right, there's generally a very small drop off in, um, in patients. When you purchase a practice, you're buying the goodwill of the practice and when done right, the seller is going to step in and help with that transition. And the amount of patient drop off should be, you know, as low as two to 3%. And on the high end, maybe 10 to 11%. Um, And so with that said, when the dentist is when the bank's looking at should we lend, um, they feel pretty good that the amount of cash that the business is going to continue to generate is going to keep keep going and being be able to service that loan. And, um, and then they have the history to support it. Those numbers you just brought up um, show that historically dentists don't default. When they go and purchase a business, um, the business is able to fully support them, provided they do it correctly. So the um, you're saying the average dental practice is selling about 750, $750,000? Yeah, that we're working with. And that's a, um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and um, so what, when, once you get once you build your practice to where it's two, three, four million, uh, you basically have an illiquid asset, don't you? Um, you just have to. It, it's a little bit more difficult to find the right buyer, but there are buyers out there for that. And would those be DSOs or who, who's the buyers? Who who provides liquidity to a two, three, four million dollar practice? So there's dentists, you, you've got to market a little bit wider than just in your local town when you have a practice of that size. Um, the last practice we did in, the, in that range um, in Southern California, a dentist from uh, New Jersey came out and purchased it and it was on the market for a little bit longer than the other practices. But he stepped in and he's doing the exact same number, so he's, he's doing excellent. Um, but with that said, the DSOs, there, there's no real cookie cutter approach with what they're looking for. And uh, the two, $3 million practice, um, they may be open to that, provided that they could implement their systems. If the practice has gotten up to that level because the dentist is just a rock star, and when you remove that dentist from the equation, um, the production is gonna drop off, you know, that's something that, that may hurt the purchase price or may require the selling dentist to stay on for. <laughs> um, but there is that kind of sweet spot. And there's different banks who lend on, who kind of have their different sweet spots as far as price goes. You go to um, some banks and they only want to lend on a hundred, um, um, under 500,000. And then others only want to talk to you if the practice is over a million. So, if you go to a bank and get turned down, that doesn't mean that every bank's gonna turn you down. It just has to do with that bank's internal portfolio and what their risk tolerance is at that moment. Who do you think is um, doing the most um, um, lending in dentistry now? So um, that's a good question. Nationally, I'm not sure. We work a lot with uh, Wells Fargo, with Bank of America, with uh, Lendever. They've been doing some good deals lately. 
Um, and then there's banks that kind of come and go. So every time a transaction comes up, I reach out to kind of my net network of um, dental professionals, dental CPAs and things like that. And I'll just throw the question out there and say, who's kind of given the best rate right now or who's being the most aggressive. And then I recommend that my clients go out and talk to and interview two or three of the banks and have them kind of compete against each other to see what the rate is and what the terms are. And what, um, what kind of interest rates and lengths of loans are you seeing? What, what, what's the bread and butter? So the interest rates just dropped, I guess, what, two weeks ago now? And um, I talked to a, a banker that I worked with at Wells Fargo, and it was uh, sub four. It was like 3.95 or something, which is um, it hasn't been that low. And I mean, they've been low for the last couple of years, but that's incredibly low. So I would say um, four to five percent interest rate on a practice purchase in California um, is kind of what you can expect now. And most of the loans are a 10 year term and um, you need a lease that's going to at least cover you during that 10 years. Um, and they some of the banks will require that you do your merchant services through them. Uh, each individual bank is going to have their own list checklist of requirements on the deal. So it's good to get that checklist as early as possible. So if any of those are a deal breaker for you, you can break off and not work with them. All right. Um, this, this is uh, just amazing information. So, um, so purchasing uh, a practice, uh, you're, you're talking about the associate um, wanting to purchase a practice and them getting finance and all that stuff. What would you say to the other side of the table, the old, the old uh, lady uh, selling the practice? What, what should she be thinking about when she's selling yeah. a practice? When, when should she call you? So the perfect scenario is three years prior to selling is when they want to start thinking about it because the valuation, generally um, the valuation's done on the prior three years financials and they can start kind of making a conscious effort to make sure that those things don't drop and that there's no things, there's nothing that comes up during that time that's going to either make the practice less marketable or decrease the price. So, um, kind of three years out and that's not always doable we have we get calls from people who have a health issue or something and they need the practice sold yesterday and we can accommodate that as well um the earlier the better though because we've got a little bit more flexibility and maneuvering with with how to do it and then how to find the right buyer so right now um it's um august of 2019 is it a buyer's market or a seller's market i mean is there more people trying to sell a practice than there are buying it or are there more yeah. people trying to buy than i mean so who, who owns this market yeah so right now i'm seeing a lot more sellers um there are a lot of buyers that are coming up but a lot of the baby boomers that that were trying to retire maybe in 2008, 2010, when the economy crashed, um, they finally kind of got their practices back up and running and got their numbers right. And the purchase prices are high enough right now to where they're finally looking to actually take that retirement. So they're starting to step away more and more. And there's quite a bit of practices on the market uh, for sale. And is it, um, I know they get sick of hearing this, but is it, um, I always hear that it's harder to sell a rural practice and an urban practice because the one thing millennials all have in common is they, they want to live in San Diego. They want to see the, the lamp. What is it? The lamp post district uh, gas, gas lamp, the gas lamp district. They want to go to a Padres game. Is it, is a dental office far more liquid if you can see the Padres stadium than it is once you're an hour and a half outside of San Diego? Yeah, um, that's a tough question for me because I'm usually involved after they're, after a buyer has found a practice and I've done just as many transactions in the rural parts of California and San Diego as some of the more dense areas. But, um, and I think it's just kind of a different personality type. I know in the rural areas, it's more common for there to be an associate buy-in. So an associate who works there and maybe lives in the area um, ends up buying out the selling doctor. And that does impact the marketability and the seller's ability to play hardball with some of the terms if, you know, there's one buyer, one potential buyer. So there is some benefit out there in that. Um, 
You know, as, as a dentist, we, we all have our perfect patients. The person just comes in and says, you know, you tell them they got five cavities. They say, you're the dentist. Just do what you do if you were me. You know what I mean? Um, who yeah. are your who are your favorite dental clients or what do the clients that do annoy you? For instance, um, they say they want to buy Johnny's practice, but they already talked to him and they already wrote down a price. And they already put things in writing. I mean, um, um, if, if somebody sees a dental office for sale, should they call oh. that dentist first or should they call you? Um, what's involved with a, um, with an LO, uh, an LOI, a letter of intent when, uh, w- what do they do that you just sit there and think, God, I wish they would not have done that. Yeah. So I'm usually okay with them reaching out to um, the dentist or whoever the broker is the, of the seller. Um, first and just kind of opening up that conversation just to see if it's a good fit for them. You know, get their get their foot in the door and see if they like the personality of the seller, see if they like the location, if the, if the equipment looks okay, if um, the interior is what they have in mind, whether that be up, needs upgrading or has just been upgraded. So I'm okay with them taking that step um, and gathering information. I wouldn't recommend doing any of the negotiation even if they think that they're negotiating a killer price on the practice, um, there's so many moving parts in a practice purchase or a practice sale that if you go in there and you beat the seller down on price and it comes way down, but then the seller's not going to budge on anything else that can really hurt the negotiations. Um, And there's some deal points that are more important than the rock bottom price uh, for the success of the practice. So, um, to answer your question, the perfect client is somebody who comes to me, they may have a practice in mind that they want to purchase or they might have a couple and, um, and they're have the personality type to look holistically and say this, these terms right here aren't necessarily ideal, but we're getting a, we're killing it in these terms. And when we look at the whole picture, um, I'm getting an overall really, really good deal. Um, and the, the harder clients are ones who get stuck on, on a minor term that, you know, isn't necessarily material, like who's going to pay for the transition letter In the scope of a $700,000 practice, the transition letter, um, might be 500 or a thousand dollars to be mailed out. And when they get stuck on that, um, it can sour the goodwill and, um, and hurt the overall transaction for them. So it's, it's really looking at it holistically and saying, you're right, this isn't ideal. The buyer and the seller should be splitting this, um, this transition letter fee. But with that said, um, for whatever reason, the seller's putting their foot down here and let's try and make up for it somewhere else so that you can be benefited that the seller is going to be okay with. Another, and, another thing, like I said, I know, I know my homies. Um, I just yeah. was at the Kentucky Dental Association uh, last week and um, – oh. Young kids, a lot of them think that they um, maybe before they talk to someone selling their practice or talk to a lawyer like you, transitioning practice, that they, they need to figure out if they should get an SBA loan. Uh, should they talk to their banker first? Um, when, when you're buying and selling a practice, what percent of these are SBA loans? Yeah, so it's, I would say maybe 30% are SBA loans. That's it? More- Only 30 yeah. Yeah, it's more common for there to be a traditional loan. And that might be the network that I'm plugged in with. Um, I'm not entirely sure with that, but I know in other practice areas, the SBA loans are a lot more common. Um, and in California, the other part of it is that uh, the re- a lot of the dentists own the real estate associated with their office, and they'll try and purchase the real estate coupled with the, coupled with the practice. Um, so they'll purchase the standalone office with the practice. And I think that from my understanding, there's a, a complication with SBA on that. There's a complication with SBA buying the real estate with the practice. And so so the let, let, let's talk about, let, let's just, out. let's just address that because, um, humans are, um, very territorial. I mean, you know, every time I let my dog out in the front yard, the first thing he does is he goes and marks his territory all around the yard. So, so yeah. many of them want to own their own land and building. But so yeah. much of the Fortune 500 company says, we're not in the real estate business. I don't want to own all these uh, pizza huts. I mean, I, they just want to rent. Um, do you think it's a wise financial decision to own all your real estate 
like Walmart does, like Kroger does, like uh, some of the, you know, um, those people, or do you think, man, just put all your money into a, uh, into great equipment and a CBCT, uh, don't own the land and building. So where, where's your gut on owning real estate or not for a young dentist? Yeah, so if the real estate purchase is the right, uh, that, that's a tough question, especially for an attorney, because my gut is, is when it's feasible, um, I'm all for it. I, I like the idea of them owning the land and owning the building, and then also down the road, if they decide to sell their practice, they can have kind of that recurring revenue from the dentist that they sell it to. Um, so there's a benefit there. And then also from a tax perspective, depending on um, what kind of income they're generating from both, it gives them a little bit more flexibility with how they allocate the rent to themselves, how they're paying the rent to themselves, how they're um, depreciating uh, some of the assets and things like that. So there is a little bit more flexibility, but the huge caveat there is it has to be the right deal. It's not kind of across the board and some of these dental condos can come with a lot of stipulations um, or office condos where you, you pay into an HOA or something along those lines. Um, the assessments can just be so detrimental. And if you're a tenant, you can negotiate around that potentially. Um, but when you're the owner, it's the bottom line kind of falls with you. So it's a case by case. In the rural areas, I see it a lot more than in, the, um, than in more dense, densely populated areas. Um, I know so many dentists who, um, when they um, sold their practice, went to go sell their practice. Well, some of them are out in California by you, like in Downey, where they're, yeah. they're like, okay, well, the practice burger guy says, oh, my practice is worth seven fifty. Then uh -huh. some real estate developer says, dude, I'll give you $2 million for your building today. And then they sell it and then they call you crying. I mean, not crying, crying, but really, really sad because the first thing developer did is just bulldoze the dental office. They didn't care about anything inside it. They were, they yeah. were ready to take a one story unit to a four story unit and um, uh, bulldoze it. So man, in a fast growing market, I just can't tell you how many, like, like I bought my land in, um, oh. I, I bought it in 87. If I told my kids what I bought that land for, they, they wouldn't even believe me. I mean, uh, so, so um, yeah. I guess it depends. If, if your real estate's exploding, it'd probably be good to get in. I know, I know Sam Walton explained it very carefully in his book and he just couldn't, uh, he, he just, he wanted control. He didn't want to have all these variables over his head on what the landlord yep. was going to do. And one landlord almost caused him and Helen to go under. And after that wow. happened, they swore they would never, ever deal uh, with the landlord again. So, um, so, um, yep. so uh, well, if, go ahead. And going back to the landlord, um, that is, I would say that of the deals that don't go through kind of after the letter of intent stage, um, it's usually one of two reasons. One is that the the uh, lending falls through. The bank finds something and the lending doesn't happen. And the other is that the landlord won't agree to the bank's terms on the loan. And so you do lose an element of control when you're working with the landlord. But the you gave a perfect example of um, of the downside if you if you do own the property and you sell it and it, you lose kind of the asset of your practice. Nice. Um, so, um, let's see the question I was going to ask you next. Um, so, um, what, um, so then before they're going to buy a practice, they, they need to know if that, if, if I buy your practice, um, uh -huh. I need the land and you're leasing, I need the landlord to assign the lease to me. Yeah. And, and what if, what if I buy your practice for $750,000 and the lease comes up in a year and I can't get this landlord to commit to renewing the lease for another five or 10 years, I'm, I may be buying a practice that a year from now has to move. Yeah. So and, and where, and where I've seen that play out again is when you go to these big strip set, not, not a strip center. Um, yep. I'm talking about an anchor, you know, something that's got a big grocery store in there and yep. the, the dentist at the very end, they live happily ever after. But if you're right next to the beast, if your dental office is right next to Kroger's fries or hinky dinky, and then all of a sudden that big monster fries decides, you know what, we want to expand our, our whatever department our vegetable department. And that means consuming your dental office. Well, the landlord's going to 
you, you lose. So, so, yeah. um, so talk about the lease pitfalls and what kind of, um, uh, lease a signage and all that stuff. Yeah. So the first thing is that we would probably call the transaction off if, if they weren't able to secure at least a five year term initially and, and ideally one to two five year options to renew on the location. And we figure that out, we try and determine that as early as possible, whether the landlord's open to that. And we do have a pretty high success rate of um, getting landlords to be open unless they have another another idea for the building altogether, like they're gonna, like you said, plow it down or something like that. But we wanna figure that out as early as possible in the process. And if that's the case, either adjust the purchase price or um, find another practice. Um, and then as far as putting your practice in a, in a kind of a strip mall or a, a retail shopping center with a Albertsons or something like that with a big anchor tenant, um, those are notoriously difficult to negotiate um, because the brokers on the other end, they just have such bargaining power because their anchor tenant pays so much of the entire center's um, uh, cost that their their leverage is just you know you're never going to compete with them as a as a small business so i would say um anytime you're looking at a practice or a startup um and a shopping center um you really want to make sure that you understand what all the risks are associated with that and whether you're going to be the exclusive dentist in that area what the foot traffic is um what the what their rights to relocate you are and that's something that's missed a lot. But um, a lot of these landlords will put in a provision that says, if our anchor tenant decides to expand their produce department and shut and move into your space, we have the right to move you from your space to another comparable space. Um, but you want to make sure that they cover the cost of your entire build out because the other space probably isn't built out to be a dental office. So there's things like that that can, that can, um, absolutely break a practice and the value of the dental practice is so closely tied to the location and your ability to lease when you move locations um, if if you move locations after you've had a long successful practice it can be done without a big patient drop-off but if you're the new dentist who just purchased something and now you're moving um, I would be, I think that there's a huge risk that you're going to have a big drop off of patients because it's no longer convenient. It's no longer the same old office. It's a new dentist and a new location. And that's the security that you're buying into the goodwill of that patient base and the consistent cash flow. Um, do you also get into, um, like, like what other, um, I, I, I'm a wet glove dentist. And so, I mean, you know, I did a molar endo yesterday i i'm always thinking okay i buy your practice and you're and you did lousy endo and yeah. every time something fails you know do i got to suck it up buttercup and redo it warranty it for free or are you going to pay for it is um how, how many of those types of uh considerations are you diving into oh all of them and and those all come in with the purchase agreement so i'll give you kind of a timeline um client reaches out to me if they're a buyer and we, we put together a letter of intent. They submit that to the seller and the seller takes that letter of intent. And if they agree to it, great. And we start the process or we negotiate some of those terms. Um, from there, we'll set up a entity. So in California, it's a professional corporation for the dentist. Other states, it can be a professional LLC, but something to limit the dentist's personal liability. And um, so we've got the LOI done, we've got their entity set up, and then we start negotiating the lease and the purchase agreement. The le and we want to start negotiating both of those as early as possible so that there's no time crunch. Um, and during that time, also working with the bank to see what you're qualified, what the dentist is qualified for and what they're um, able to be approved for. So are they, so, are they mostly all qualified and approved for about the same amount? I mean, or is there, um, what, what is, what, what is the big outlier as to why I got approved for more than you? Yeah. So it does vary. Personal credit is a big deal. Um, student loans do have a little bit of weight there as well. Um, but the big one that we see is what do you purchase first, your practice or your home? 
And especially in California, where if you get out of dental school and you're making good money as an associate and you go and buy a five or seven hundred thousand dollar home, um, your ability to to pay a practice debt or a loan is going to be impacted by that. So that's really the big variable that's going to um, that's going to change the bank's willingness to lend. OK, so so what what are what is the difference in good credit and bad credit? Are you saying? I mean, what what, what happened? So as far as oh, it, it's just a, a dentist personal credit if it, they do take that into account. So if a dentist has, you know, under I don't know exactly what the numbers are, um, but I would say under a 650, um, you know, they'd be it, that that would be a point against them with the amount that they could be lent. Okay, what if they fell in love with somebody in their class and now, um, you know, two kids got married and they each had 284 and then one of them's best idea was to go on to ortho school for another three years and now they're married and together they have a million dollars in student loans. Are they yeah. just going to be working at Aspen until they're 103 or when when could they get financing? Yeah, not necessarily. And there's enough banks out there with different programs that can treat that differently. So, you know, you're right. They do have that million dollars in debt, but they also have double the earning potential. And there may be a bank out there that looks at their earning potential and says, we have two dentists here that if one of them um, goes out on disability, the other one can step in and work, which a single dentist family doesn't have. So there's there's factors like that that come into play. But I think the moral of the story is, is that it's worth going through the legwork with the bank to, you shouldn't count yourself out prior to talking to the bank. And banks are usually pretty good at saying, no, this deal's not right for me, but here's another bank that I think would be able to do the deal for you. And, um, and then at some point you'll well, be able whenever to. Whenever I do that, it's, it means I don't like the patient or the dentist I'm referring him to. It's like when I have a real P-I-T-A, I'm like, I got a dentist for you. He's so much better than me. Oh my God, yeah. go see my friend. Um, is that the way the bankers are or is it this, or is no. it more a core competency thing? It's, it's more a core competency thing. They each keep their own portfolios of risk tolerance. And so if, if one bank just did 10 deals that were each $2 million practices, they might not have any risk for practices over a million dollars for the rest of the year until those practices start paying off. And so when they get a practice a month ago, it would have been a perfect deal for them. But today it's no longer a perfect deal because their portfolio has shifted. So it's constantly changing and the bankers are aware of that and they're willing to kind of pass it around and they, they've kind of got those relationships built out. But I've never seen a a banker turned down business. They, they make plenty of money on the loan. So um, regardless of how difficult the, the client is to work with. Huh, interesting. Um, and uh, I, I, you know, I've been talking all about the, the old guy selling the dental office to the young guy. Um, yep. But when should um, these young kids think about estate planning? Do you, yep. you, you, you're big into estate planning too. Um, yeah, you know, when, when you come out of school, you're 25. I mean, when, when, when do you, when do you need to start thinking about that, that, that subject? Yeah. So the two primary times are, um, once you have children and then once you own real estate, that's when I'd say it's absolutely important, regardless of your, um, of the amount of assets that you have. Um, and the reason being is that if you don't have a valid revocable trust in place, um, then you're going to have to go through probate and it's going to be a nightmare. And with dentists in particular, if you own your own corporation, you want to figure out what the strategy is for transferring the value of that to your spouse. If they're a non dentist, because it's not like, um, it's not like having a hardware store or something like that, where your spouse can just take over the store and start working it and, and continue to make money for the rest of their life with the business you built. As a dentist, um, if something happens to you, if you become disabled or if you pass away, um, your spouse can't take over that business um, unless they're a licensed dentist. So you want to come up with some sort of kind of secession plan or strategy to uh, strategy to make sure your family's okay in the event that something happens to you. Huh. Interesting. Um, my gosh, I can't believe we already went for an hour. Um, 
Tell, tell me how what was it like in Seoul, Korea? A uh, year out of you graduated from Purdue out there yeah. in Hoosierville, Indiana, halfway between yeah. Indianapolis and Chicago. By the way, they did find out what a Hoosier comes from. Did you hear that on NPR? And was it the people walking through the cornfield? That's what I had heard. No, it was it's serious. Not even a joke. Um, when they when they were building America's railroads, they were laying down five miles of track a day. So uh -huh. when I'm going through your town, it doesn't make any sense to get to know you. We're on. So you would just say you're one of somebody's men. And sure enough, uh -huh. a man named Hoosier laid a railroad all the way across Indiana. And it would have been totally customary if someone said, who are you? You would have said, I'm, I'm one of Hoosier's boys. Um, but um, but in saying that, um, um, the, the, um, yeah, that's a much better story than than what I had heard. I had heard it was from people coming through the cornfields and the person on the porch yelling, who's there? Who's there? And, yeah, I yeah. was heard it, who's your daddy? Uh, but yeah. but the um, but what, what did what was the takeaway in uh, in Seoul, Korea? How, how, oh, I mean, I, there's so many major dental companies there. Um, but yeah. um, what, what was that like a year out of Purdue? I, Purdue I to go. Their, their technology there is so far advanced. Um, with everything that you do. And this was back in, I, I guess, 2006. And they were just kind of rolling out Wi-Fi for everybody and all of that. But um, I loved Korea. It was a total culture shock for me growing up in San Diego, um, going out there, which I absolutely loved and loved the people. They were, they were fun. Um, I loved the people that I worked with. It was just all around a cool experience. And when the year was up, I, I was contemplating staying for another year, but decided it's probably time to come back and start real life. Yeah, I love South Korea. Um, that, that is amazing. And when you're out there lecturing to dental students um, and you're doing your lectures, your webinars, what, what, what are the main topics that you're uh, that you're lecturing on? Yeah, so we I, the, the big one is what to do after you graduate and um, break that down into going out and working as an associate and what to ask for with a, as an associate agreement. Um, and then also at what point are you ready to purchase your practice? Um, so that's one of the lectures that we do. And then another one is um, the actual practice purchase process, the timeline and pitfalls to avoid and, and um, things to request throughout that process. Um, so we dive into the purchase agreement, the lease, and then, um, and then another one is just the general estate planning for dentists. Those are kind of the big areas. And, and the general estate planning, uh, I mean, she's got so many things on her table. Um, she, you, you say she can comfortably just wait till she's ready to have a baby. And if, if, if you're still single and you don't have a baby and you got yeah. other, other uh, it, fires to put out, is the estate planning can go on the back burner? So you can't ask an attorney that question because there's a million scenarios where that's the absolute and, worst and, advice. And how, but, did, how did Prince and Aretha Franklin both die without a will? I mean, what? who was on their management team that thought, oh, Aretha, yeah, yeah you, don't, oh, you don't need a will? Well, and I think that's part of the pro problem is people, it's never really the right time to do it. You know, when do you want to sit down and talk about your death? Um, and so people just push it off and push it off. And then before you know it, their Prince or Aretha and, or, um, I think Marilyn Monroe was another big one. Bob got, Marley, Bob Marley. Yeah. He Michael was Jack. against the machine, but the machine ate all of his wealth in legal fees and his kids got nothing. I mean, um, it's just, um, um, it's again, it's a social animal wants to be yep. nice, wants to be friend. They don't want to have uncomfortable situations. And I almost think, um, the more sociopathic you are, the better you would be as like say a general in war. Cause I mean, you knew D-Day, yep. you knew D-Day was gonna be yep. a bloodbath. So when you're drawn up the plan and that didn't bother you, you're yep. probably a good general, but I wouldn't want to be on your team. And Absolutely. I mean, you know, you just walk into work and everybody wants to ask, you know, how was your breakfast? And it's like breakfast, how was, you know, so again, yeah, let's go to work. Out. Let's go to yeah. work. Let's talk about something uncomfortable. And I, I'm sorry that you heard it first on Dentistry Uncensored, but everyone listening to this podcast eventually will die. In fact, I've already got five people that I've interviewed that are no longer here on, on, on the show. I mean, hell, I did Carl Misch, Bob Ibsen. 
Um, you know, there, uh, I, I've interviewed five people on this show that are, are no longer with us. If you don't yeah. have a will, if you don't, then you're, you're going to turn it over to probate. So just get used to talking about uncomfortable things because it will make you a better dentist because the yeah. best dentists in the world are the ones that can look you in your eye and say, I know you want to go to Disneyland. I know you want a new car. I know you want all this stuff, but look, the average American is going to buy 13 new cars in their lifetime between 16 and 74 that average price of a new car is 33,500 and buddy you know what your next next car is it's going to be your mouth because you need you have seven fillings eight crowns three implants a sinus lift you know blah 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 and what you really need to do is just whatever the hell you're driving just drive it for an extra year or two because you yep. need to get your mouth all fixed up and, and then I look out at these dentists and one out of every 20 dentists does a 10, 20, $30,000 case every Friday, their whole career. And then the other five dentists on the same corner will never do one in their entire career and blame the whole thing on, oh, it's the economy, it's the trade deficit. Obama got blamed for everything. I mean, when Obama's president, if you woke up constipated, you say, how did Obama do that? I mean, I mean, yeah. they blame it on everything except Michael Jackson's favorite song, the man in the mirror. You know, you know yeah. why you don't do, you know why you practice 40 years and never sold an American who bought 13 new cars one time? Did you redo their mouth? Because you you won't talk about anything uncomfortable. And yeah. lawyers, lawyers are about being uncomfortable because they're gonna tell you every single thing that can possibly go wrong. And you're a dentist, you're not an attorney, and feigning expertise. I'm um, not 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 and and when you feign expertise. Uh, it's like my boys. I tell them, don't ever lie to your dad because because it's not about lying to your dad. It's about lying to yourself. You know, don't just yeah. don't lie to yourself. You have a problem and don't sugarcoat it. And who else is going to be your number one fan advisor to run this by? So find yeah. an attorney, um, get a relationship. You're a dentist. You're not an attorney. And when you go meet that attorney, don't ask him if he's got a dog or a cat or why the hell. He chose to move back from Creed and go to San Diego Chargers when he knew the Oakland Raiders were not in San Diego. I mean, I don't even know what you were thinking. Uh, but um, I, I vote, by the way, that you just become an Arizona Cardinals fan. I mean, we got it. They're, they're we, pretty high on the list. We got a great team. It's only a six-hour drive. By the way, everybody that lives in Phoenix, their fantasy is to live where you live. And every yeah. time I go to San Diego, I'm just like, why do I live in Phoenix? It's 115 today. What, what is it in San Diego? Oh, it's, it's not bad today. Maybe high 70s. Oh, my God. Oh, my yeah, God. We'll... Yeah, me and, in fact, even the president of our company, Lori Zalowski, she's always like, why why do we live in the desert? Of course, this time of year of August, you know, you're, uh, um, you've are you had enough. But, hey, um, seriously, um, thank you so much, Matthew. Matthew W. Odgers, I got I to gotta ask you this. Um, they see that ESQ, Esquire. A lot of these kids yeah. don't even know what an Esquire is. They see JD. What is the difference between a JD and an Esquire? I know they all know what an Escort is, but what, what's the difference between an Escort yeah. and an Esquire? Well, when you get a chance, look up Esquire online because I think the real definition is is a pompous title that <laughs> attorneys give themselves from the back in the day. But the difference is, is that the JD is the degree that you get, a Juris Doctorate from law school. So you can get a JD, um, but not be a practicing attorney. And from my understanding is that once you become an attorney and pass the bar, then you can use the ESQ. But again, that kind of, that, that's how I denote it. So when you see, when I see somebody who has their name and then JD, I usually, I guess I assume that they're not a practicing attorney, but they have a background in law. And, and, and a JD is a is a uh, doctorate in jurisprudence. So, do you consider yourself yeah. a doctor? I don't. Yeah, and I, I I don't like that about our culture because you always have these uh, idiot journalists on TV, and they'd be like interviewing the Federal Reserve, and yeah. the Federal Reserve, uh, you know, he had like a PhD in economics, and his thesis was on the Great Depression, and they're talking to him like yeah. it, like everything he's saying is his opinion. But the the fact that television the only doctor they recognize is a physician. Well, then that yeah. takes away from real news versus fake news. Like when you're talking to Alan Greenspan and he has a PhD, he's a doctor. He's not making this shit up. 
But when yeah. you're talking to somebody who was a successful pizzeria guy, that that's yeah. free enterprise. And and I am, um, you know, a lawyer is a doctor of law and you're a doctor of dentists. And I wrote a, a column last year called um, stay in your own lane. And the smartest dentists are the ones that say, I'm a doctor of dentistry. They stay in their lane and then they develop a nice trustworthy team. And what I like most about my attorney is um, when I met Ray Harris, his social network was so intense that so yeah. many of my relationships, the 30, the, the 20 years following meeting Ray Harris, what he, he already knew the person. I mean, how yeah. connected are you in the San Diego community? Oh, absolutely. And that's why a few of the questions you, we talked about today, um, you have your tight knit network and to yeah. ask a broad question. Yeah. When I go to answer it, I think, you know, that, that could be completely different when you get outside, even within San Diego, when you get outside of my network, yeah, the way it, that we operate. Yeah. And, and you know what my homies do? And it's so romantic, but it's so wrong. They, they go pick their, they, they go to their church. They ask okay. their pastor, I need a lawyer. And they're like, Oh, Jonathan's a lawyer. I'm sure yeah. he's a great guy, but you're his first dentist case. I, yeah. I don't want a great pastor to sit next to in church. I want someone, if I'm doing dental law, I want someone that only does dental law. Just like if I have an eye problem, I don't want to go to a, a chiropractor. I want to go to someone who only does eyes. And looking back, homies, what I look back and realize that the best connections I made in Phoenix to my social network for business and estate and everything uh, started first with Ray Harris and then moved out from there. And I have never called Ray and said, okay, here's the problem. Uh, my kid's uh, ankle bracelet fell off and uh, and now the cops are on the way. Uh, what, what should I do now? He always knows. He always yeah. knows the person. And then when you call him up and then you're dealing with the element of trust and the trust, all that. Hey, I sure hope you make us an online CE course. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, it's I, I reached out to the person you gave me and I'm working on one. Okay, I'm. if you want to uh, ask me a question, I'm Howard at Dentaltown.com. If it's online CE or the message boards, it's the other Howard, which is Howard Goldstein. So he's Hogo oh, okay. at Dentaltown.com. Or just drop a message in the uh, comments um, um, and, and YouTube or whatever. But um, seriously, dude, uh, Matthew Odgers, thank you so much for coming on the show today. Oh. And sharing your a massive amount of dental attorney expertise. I hope you have a rocking hot day. Yeah, absolutely. You have a good one too.